table for one, please. This is Solo Travel Talk. Your solo travel advisor is Astrid Clements. Do not listen to this episode if you're hungry, dear listeners. Welcome to Solo Travel Talk. I'm producer Catherine. Dining solo is a big concern of a lot of people who consult with Astrid about their travel. On this episode, you are going to learn some excellent tactics for making sure you are comfortable as a solo diner. You'll learn how to get the most out of the experience of eating. And finally, Astrid weaves in a couple of great stories of her solo travel, solo dining adventures. Let's get to Astrid and hear about the concern some have about dining solo. Solo travel is first and foremost fabulous. And part of solo travel is solo dining. This is the topic of this particular podcast and probably more than any topic that I get, except for maybe safety, that makes people have reservations about should I really travel solo, is the solo dining. You know, I have people saying that, oh, I'm going to feel so out of wits or alone or lonely. And how do you do, how do you, how do you deal with this, Astrid? So I tell them, first and foremost, it does take some practice. You know, you, you need to uh, maybe go to the coffee shop more often or, you know, go somewhere and have breakfast by yourself. But the more you do it, it becomes easier. But I want to share with the listeners the statistics that show that solo dining is becoming more and more a reality. And actually, people are comfortable with doing it, and they are enjoying themselves. So Open Table, which is an app, uh, a technology company where you can find out fabulous information about all kinds of restaurants and uh, make your reservations online. They did a survey or a study two years ago, and one of the uh, things that came out in the survey was that solo dining reservations were up 62 percent, and that you know, that that was clearly showing that more and more people were dining solo. The The study said that Dallas is the most popular city in the United States for solo dining. Then you've got uh, Miami Beach. You have Denver, New York, Philadelphia, Las Vegas, and Chicago. But, but basically, uh, the statistics even now are showing that people are dining solo. My particular uh, first, I guess, aha moment uh, dealing with solo dining was when I was in Paris. And it was probably about, oh, 15, 17 years ago. I was staying at a beautiful hotel, a little small hotel right there on the left bank at the St. Germain de Pre. It's, it's kind of a, a square in that area. Well, across the street from the hotel was Cafe Floor. And Cafe Floor, it, it, it's one of the most favorite spots of Parisians, especially Parisians who are educated or who are accomplished. And I don't want to kind of say, you know, the rich and famous, but uh, it's a comfortable cafe, and it's been popular for probably a hundred years now. So it's just got a lot of good vibe in there, and people still love it. Well, I decided that every night before I went to bed, I'd go over there and have a glass of wine. My son was traveling with me at the time, and he was, you know, on the streets of Paris just exploring. So I would go over there and have a glass of wine. Well, I think it was second or third evening, I noticed this very well-dressed, what I would consider sophisticated, elegant, just this woman who I was just, it was hard, I had a hard time (laughs) not staring at her. But she was sitting there eating, having a glass of wine, so serene, and just so content. And when I saw that, I thought, now this lady has really got it together. If here in Paris, 
the most romantic city in the world, a city where, you know, just you, you, Paris is always wonderful. Well, here is a beautiful woman who could dine with anybody. She is enjoying herself, having this nice meal. And like I said, she's very well dressed. She didn't just, you know, uh, put on some jeans and go. She, she, this was something that she went to enjoy her evening with herself and the food. And, and that made a big impression on me. So from that point, you know, you can be pretty alone eating room service in your room. <laughs> and room service is expensive in hotels. So... I think this is a great skill to work on and to to try to be real good at. I'm, I'm a little curious, just from your perspective, what do you think is the root of this dining alone fear? Because that story you just told really illustrates somebody being confident and enjoying themselves and out having a wonderful meal. So what do you think is at that, at that core? Well, I think that it's probably something with the individual is still uh, maturing and learning how to be happy alone, learning how to like their own company without having somebody to filter it. In, in realizing that you don't have to have others or another person in order to uh, do things that you enjoy. So I think that it's probably... People have not had the need to or the opportunity to have to deal with being alone. So I think that's some of it. When you don't, when you've not gotten yourself to that point where you can be happy alone, um, it does give you some some un, unrealistic and maybe some realistic fears. You're just not there yet. So that that's kind of my answer to it. Yeah, because I've, I've thought about a lot of people who they go on walks alone, they might go out and visit a museum by themselves. But some, there's something about the eating alone that's almost like a embarrassment about it that I always kind of think is, and I, you know, I might have it a little bit too. It's just that there's, it's a little bit different for some reason, feeling like people are going to think something's weird because <laughs> nobody wanted to have a dinner with you or whatever. Or you might be sad or something. something that they yeah. say something's wrong with you. Well, it might, too, go back to, you know, we're all family-oriented, or most of us had a family, uh, especially the older audience. And dinner time together or eating together was really part of the bonding and the family love. It's like a center part of your family life. Yeah, but it's not so much like that anymore with working, you know, mothers and, and you know, just very busy people, even uh, at a young age. You know, you just kind of, you're eating on the run or you're eating by yourself or you're going to the refrigerator when nobody else is in the house. So it's, it's different. It's just changing. Yes, it's changing. And like I said, the statistics are showing I'm Proving it, it yeah. <laughs> How do you, as a solo traveler, pick where you're going to eat? Okay. Well, it depends on the kind of trip. I still do uh, business travel solo. And then, of course, my pleasure solo trip. So if it's on a business trip, I have to watch out in terms of the expense. And so I accordingly no focus on I'm going to try to find a real nice place but something that's moderately priced as well as I I like to try to eat at a restaurant that is close to walking distance to my hotel because if I'm going to dine at night then I don't want to be too far from the hotel Uh, so those are kind of my two things but first and foremost I always go to the concierge I mean I've done some research before I've, I've gone Uh, or I've left home if there's a real fabulous place that I want to go or whatever. But the bottom line is I go to the concierge and explain to him what I'm in the mood to eat, what are his recommendations. I would like it to be within walking distance. And they always give me great, you know, great suggestions. So that's kind of how I work that in general. Now, as far as the pleasure trips... Well, I want to back up. I want to talk about one uh, one recommendation I got here 
uh, recently when I went to New York City because it was a great place for solos to dine, as well as groups or couples. But it's a new concept restaurant and food emporium called Italy. And it's basically, it's, it's focused on Italian cuisine and Italian food. And these, these places, I think there are three now, but they are fabulous. They have, within the, the Italy, they have all these different types of Italian food restaurants. They're little small areas, but, you know, one focuses on pasta, one focuses on um, seafood, another will, uh, there's a fine dining aspect or restaurant in it. Others will focus, you know, another area will focus on pizza. And all the different types or variations of Italian cuisine you can eat there. Oh, it is fabulous. Even they even have like fresh Italian salads, all mm-hmm. kinds of different salads that the Italians eat. They have a wine bar. And then on top of that, they have takeout. They have a grocery store with, I mean, the cheese is there. It was just, it blew my mind, all the different we're, cheeses. We're all drooling now. We, we I, got I mean, you should. <laughs> you should. And then they have a, a bookstore there with all kinds of Italian cooking books and, and cooking uh, different appliances you can buy. I mean, this is so such a new concept that is on ho- such a high quality. Well, there are all kinds of solos in there. There are groups in there. There are couples in there. The vibe is great. I mean, this is a great place. So remember, if you're in New York City, try to find Italy. And and I guarantee you, you're going to have a great solo dining experience. I went there twice. I liked it so much. We'll, we'll put a link to their website in our show notes here. Great, great. Okay. Well, let's talk about when I travel for pleasure, how I decide, you know, where I'm going to eat, et cetera. Well, first of all, I, like I said at the beginning of the of the show, I do a lot of pre-trip research. I do research into what types of food uh, the particular culture eats and the preparation of the food, uh, anything that's unique to food uh, where I'm traveling. So I do that. Then I also, um, you know, read a lot of reviews on restaurants. I'll Google in top 10 restaurants. I'll Google in Michelin restaurants. I'll Google in best uh, tangine restaurants, say, if I was in Morocco or whatever. And I'm going to talk about Morocco a little little later. Oh, their food is fabulous. But (laughs) uh, so I will make a list of all of these places where I'd like to eat. And I jot down the address, etc. So once I get to where I'm going, I go right to the concierge, and I give him the list and tell and let him filter and say, "Yes, this is great," or mm, "It might be overrated," or "It was great," or what whatever. So I let them filter that. Plus, I get their recommendations because those concierges, they they really do know where to go. And so um, I'll do that, and then I'll I'll have him uh, map where these different restaurants are on my map. So I'll kind of know the areas as I plan each day. Say I'll be in one particular neighborhood that I will know that these two restaurants are in that neighborhood, so I won't miss the opportunity. That's kind of of how I work it, and and I definitely star must go to, you know. Every city or everywhere you go, there are a couple of great restaurants, either ethnic or fine dining, that, I mean, really, if you love food, you should go there because it it really will be part of your memory of the trip. One little tip, uh, I love to give tips, but museum cafes, they are always typically really good places for solo dining, especially at lunch. I really have never had a bad meal at a museum cafe, and especially in Vienna. Oh, Vienna has some of the most beautiful restaurants and cafes in their museums. So or, or, think of that. You know, it's not a typical restaurant you would go to, but a lot of times the cafes and the museums are great. Good tip. Okay. Then you have your random selections. 
where am I going to eat? Like if if you've been sightseeing or doing a lot of things and it's about one o'clock and you don't really have anything anywhere specific you want to eat. And I would say probably half of where I eat is uh, uh, serendipity or, you know, it just comes up. But there are a couple of things that I use to decide where I, I want to eat. And I'll kind of go into what I consider are the characteristics of a solo friendly uh, dining place or a solo friendly restaurant. Because, you know, there are a lot of restaurants that are really not solo friendly. They're really geared to either s- tables of four or groups or couples or whatever that you probably should pass on, you know. As this trend keeps growing and has grown, there are a lot of things that restaurants have done that make them solo friendly. So how I I decide is I'll peek in, and if I like the vibe, and everybody looks like they're relaxed and happy, that's first and foremost. It's got to have a good vibe. If you walk in and it's kind of quiet or... You just don't feel comfortable? Keep walking down the street. (laughs) Uh, Next, I like attractive decors. I think that part of when you travel to see all the different decors, whether it's in restaurants or the hotels or palaces or whatever, it's just so interesting to see how, you know, a place is is put together and decorated. So I look at that. I look to see, oh, do I like this? And so if it makes a good impression, and it doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, it can be very basic neighborhood or ethnic or whatever, but th- it has to just be well put together, clean, because that all shows that the the restaurateur, the owner, care, and there's something good here. And I also like an added thing is if they have music. If there's music, oh, that makes it even much better. So just that first initial impression is important to me. If I don't like what I see, I move on. Then secondly, I notice, and this is one of the biggest things that a solo diner needs to make sure that is good. How the seating is organized or the different seating arrangements. Because restaurants, especially the the newer ones that are really in line with the trends, they have a lot of different types of seating arrangements now. And that you know, some of them are geared solely to the solo diner. And it kind of started out with being able to eat at the bar. Now, it's evolved from that. So if you go into a restaurant and you see a bar and there are people around there and it's not, they're just not drinking, you know, at the bar, typically you get to eat there at the bar. And that's not bad, especially for somebody who just wants to eat They don't want to talk to anybody, or maybe they might want to talk to somebody who's next to them. But they don't have to see the other people in the restaurant. Their back is to the other diners. So a lot of people, they're comfortable with that. And now what we're seeing is that the bars are being uh, constructed around open kitchens. So you can sit there and watch the chefs prepare wonderful dishes. I mean, you get a little mini cooking lesson <laughs> right there. So it's, it's, um, it, that's a good place now. So notice to see if there's bar seating. And also with bar seating, you typically don't have to wait. If there is an opening, you can go right in. And that's one of the, the um, problems sometimes with solo dining. It takes you a little longer to be seated. Mm. Because, you know, every table is like real estate to a restaurateur. They want to get as many people at a table and get you in and get you out. So it's it, saying you'll sit at the bar, it works pretty good if you want to get in and out quick. Then the second type of seating, which is becoming more and more popular, and the first time I saw it was at Asia Cuba in New York, and that was probably about 15 maybe 18 years ago, but they they started with the communal tables. And the communal tables can sit, you know, sit uh, a couple of couples, a group of 
10 uh, and a solo person here and there. And if you are comfortable in doing that, there are that's a great way to meet people. Because people typically who are sitting at a communal table are communal, you know. So that that's good. So look for the communal tables, okay, if that's what you like. Now, what I really like is I like restaurants that have, and this kind of throws back to what I saw in Paris, and it's been that way since the first time I went in 1968, but and it's it's kind of a bistro type of seating arrangement. But they'll have a long banquette or like a couch along a wall, and then they'll put a small table. Which, if there are couples, you know, they can sit side by side. Or great for a solo diner because you're only taking up that one small table. So a restaurateur is much more comfortable with you know, seating you somewhere nice. And here you can people watch. You can look out at the restaurant. And I like that because I can enjoy my food. I like the way uh, that is. I have my own little personal space, but I'm not like, uh, you know, on a table of four or whatever. And I must say, if a maitre d' wants to sit you in the middle of the restaurant in a table of four. That's the worst place to be seated. Except maybe if you're putting put by the busing station or a little... Ta- oh, that's awful. And just refuse. I will never sit there. I mean, I can probably be starving to death and I will not sit there. That is so demeaning. So don't don't even go there. But notice the seating arrangements and notice where you want to sit. Okay, so if the restaurant, you know, the this random restaurant has overcome all those things, then I ask to see the menu. <laughs> I want to see I'd like to see the price points, and then I'd like to see, you know, what's offered. Uh, Do they have any prefixed meals? One of the things I like to do is I like to eat my big, expensive meal at lunch. And a lot lot of times you can go to very fine restaurants at lunch, and they'll have, like, a prefixed meal or Tuesday's, you know, special or whatever, and it can be really, really nice and half the cost than if you were dining at dinner. So I look at the menu, and if it, I like what I see and the price is right, uh, then, I sit, then I ask to be seated. So that's kind of uh, how I look for it, it you know, the, the solo-friendly dining. Also, as I'm there, you know, if the waiter is attentive, uh, if the maitre d' comes over, if, it, if they continue to make you feel like... Uh, you know, stay as long as you want to stay. Attended to. Yes, yes, it, that you're valuable. That's a good so. That's a, a good sign too. So, that's kind of the basics as far as sight. Now, the other thing that I use in his, you know, we, we live in the world of technology and apps. I use three apps. One particularly, it's called Zomato. Used to be Urban Spoon, but it is great. I mean, you click on Zumato, and they will show you all the restaurants close by, how far it is to walk to them, what the menus are, photos of it, price ranges, how to get there, opening hours, reviews, the whole thing. So if if you're in the mood for Vietnamese food in Lisbon or whatever, you can, all you have to do is hit this app. It is absolutely wonderful. So I use that. Sometimes if I don't know where I want to go or can't find something, I just click on Zomato. Also TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor is very good. If you click on, they have a great app, and you click on that city, and you click on food, oh, my God. And then they know where you are, too, and then it goes from there. So those two are great. They really are, and you should have them on your smartphone, and you really should uh, learn how to use them. The last one that I've just recently started using, and especially in the United States, is an app called Food Trucks. Now, Food Trucks, if you would have told me six years ago, 
I would be eating out of food trucks. I would have told you, well, I think I would rather not. But these food trucks have just upped the quality of their food and just their whole joie de vivre for for food and affordability and just just doing something good you know i like to do to look at that especially if i'm in the united states uh here recently i was in dallas last year and i clicked on it and i realized that on sunday they have it was either saturday or sunday i was pretty sure it was on sunday but they have all these food trucks that go to an area downtown around this big park and everybody a lots of people are there families solos couples i mean it is it is so much fun to go down there at this time well i i had this food truck that had supposedly the best lobster rolls in the United States that CN, they had been on CNN, Food Network, all these kinds of things, and they won all kinds of, of uh, awards for their lobster rolls. Now, when you're in Texas, you usually eat Tex-Mex or something like that, but I love lobster. I thought the best lobster wor- roll in the United Prove States. Yeah. I mean, I've been to Kenny Bunkport and been to the crab shack and that's pretty good too and I, I was just oh my god that lobster roll was great and i think i got fresh limeade with it or something i sat out they had little tables in different areas in this big park area and i sat out there and i just celebrated being in dallas this great lobster roll in that you know uh what a great day it was it was really nice so if you if you want to See what's going on with food trucks. Get the food truck app. So those those are kind of my suggestions. I mean, some of it is common sense. Some of it is uh, preparation. If you if you kind of stick to those 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 things, you you're on the right track. I want to go a little bit deeper, if we can, about some of the special options. You mentioned like the communal tables and the chefs' tables. Can you give a little bit more on those things for the solo traveler? Here again, when I started my blog and uh, my whole concept and website, Astrid Solo Travel Advisor, I really did start trying to get a lot of feedback uh, dealing with solo dining, whether it was from the waiters or the owners of restaurants or people who were dining solo, whatever. I wanted to get... Uh, what was going on in their mind and how they approached it or what they liked about it or didn't, etc. So um, I remember one special lunch that I had at Commander's Palace. Now, for those of you who've been to New Orleans, where Commander's Palace is located, you know that New Orleans is a town of fabulous food. There are so many fabulous restaurants in New Orleans. Uh, it's unbelievable. If a restaurant is not good, it goes out of business. I mean, New Orleans is so discerning. Oh, it's it's hard to eat bad in New Orleans. It's, it, it's hard. It's hard. Well, Commander's Palace is one of the oldest, most famous uh, place to go eat in New Orleans. It's located in the Garden District. And uh, there are a lot of... Th- people that are solo that go there because they're either widowed or or whatever you know in new orleans kind of like in paris it it, then people have dined alone more or earlier than in a lot of other areas okay so i was going to um have lunch one saturday during their jazz brunch so I, I went in and I told the maitre d' I, I was solo and everything, and um, he sat me in a real nice area. It was kind of like I, I was talking about the seating. I like to sit like when the seating is on the the rim of the room, like, you know, along the wall or whatever, so I can see out maybe a little bit in a corner or whatever. So I, you know, I was graciously uh, greeted and brought to my seat, etc., and given my menu. And 
the the waiter was very nice and so he he within like probably about mm, five minutes he brings me a little lanyap course which at a lot of fine dining restaurants all over the world the chef wants to show you something that he's just created or whatever to whet your appetite to get you excited about this experience that you're going to have so he did that and then I, it just kind of came to me, I'm going to ask him uh, if they have anything that they do for solo diners that is extra or whatever. And so I asked him, I started to ask him these questions, and his first answer was, when a solo diner checks in with the maitre d', the maitre d' automatically puts in that this diner is solo and they get VIP treatment. So a solo diner at Commander's Palace will get VIP treatment. They will get the little extras all through the meal. And they are, I mean, just from the way they put the, the, they help you put the napkin in your lap to, I mean, at Commander's, if you have black on, they'll get you black napkins. I mean, it is, it's, it's just wonderful. The regular service is VIP, so I can't even imagine oh, what the uh, solo... Tra- <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. It is It is just... I mean, you feel so special, and it, it's really nice. Then the menu, they have prefixed types of menus. And at Commander's, the food is very rich in, in lots of Creole dishes, and they know how to mix the right appetizers with the entrees, etc. And what the food proportions should be. You know, the the waiter will kind of share with you that he thinks this is good and blah, blah, blah. And all of that is, is great. And so I, I just want you to kind of think about, it. here I was, Commander's Palace, enjoying this meal. He was talking about the VIP treatment, and I could really see it unfolding. And I understood that. And I thought, how smart a restaurant can be. It, this has to be one of their secrets, you know. So, uh, you know, I ended up getting in the second line. For those of you who've never been to New Orleans, the second line is uh, part of uh, jazz music. They have typical songs where people get so happy about being alive and and doing what they're doing that they get up and they just parade around. (laughs) And and in Commanders, we all had our napkins and they were playing music. So, I mean, you know, that's a great solo dining experience. And it was really nice. And you didn't feel goofy or just like you were, you know, trying to. It's it just, it, there's, in, in a good restaurant, you will feel that way. You, there's a natural just comfort there. So that's one example that uh, I wanted to, to share that kind of shows you that uh, certain restaurants give solo diners VIP treatment. I do want to give one other example because it was such a memorable time for me, and I'll be quick with this. But I was in St. Petersburg, Russia. First time I'd ever been there, I think it was about 10 years ago. I was staying at, I think, the best hotel in St. Petersburg. It was at that time called the Grand Hotel. It's now the Belmont Grand. But my last night in Russia, I wanted to go to the Caviar Bar, which the Caviar Bar is in this hotel. It's very highly rated, and you go there, and they have tasting menus, and they just, they really do the caviar uh, experience at the highest level. Mm. So I go up there, kind of early because I, I, you know, had to go back and pack. But I go, and I'm just completely aggravated. It was closed for remodeling. Oh. So oh. so I, I I walk away. And at that time, the maitre d' kind of noticed that I was, you know, disappointed. And he looked at me and said, would you like to, to dine in La Europa restaurant? And I said, well, I guess so. He said, don't worry about it. He said, you come in. I'll set you a table for one. And if you want, I'll get you a Financial Times or something to read. He said, we have 
wonderful pre-fixed menus. And I promise you, you won't be sad that you didn't get into the caviar bar. So I go in and they proceed to set my table. Well, first of all, the, the clientele in this restaurant was just, I mean, it was really up there. The interior of it is grand. I mean, they have little areas where they're little small rooms that have curtains that they can open and close. They have balconies Mm -hmm. where they're diners. I mean, this is old world elegance at the highest level. He set this table and put down a silver three candle candelabra and lit it. So here I had a candlelight dinner, three course meal with wine for $68 and the complete shock and the best part of it all was at the end of the restaurant was a stage and i didn't realize that when i first walked in because it must the performance must have been breaking but for 2 hours i had the most magnificent classical concert from string quartet to pian- excuse me, piano sonata to some opera singers, uh, a ballet pas de deux. I mean, it was an extravaganza of Russian performing artists. It was, I mean, that, I'll never forget that night. In fact, I blogged about it. If you go to my website, you can read, you know, dinner for one (laughs) or table for one. But I had a great time. And and I didn't think at one time that I needed somebody there while I was enjoying myself. So that that just kind of gives you uh, a, an idea that good restaurants all over the world treat solo diners really special. And let me tell you what's I think behind this philosophy. In one. Uh, another restaurateur in New Orleans told me this one time, and I think this is the right philosophy or mindset, is a good restaurant realizes or wants to make the solo dining experience really nice because they realize that if the diner has a bad experience, they'll never come back. And most all solo diners do come back to good restaurants, and they don't come back solo. They'll come back with their friends. They'll come back with their family, etc. But if you don't treat them well, and they don't enjoy the food and the experience when they're solo, they're not coming back. <laughs> so that's the bottom line. <laughs> you do, at the good restaurants, they know how to deal uh, with the solo diner and make the solo diner glad they came. I wonder some if for some of the listeners who are maybe a little nervous about going ner- solo that you're painting this picture where they get even better treatment. That's pretty enticing. And that's the truth. That is the truth. Because they, you know, obviously they know that you're by yourself. So they've trained the waiters to talk to you and ask you different questions. And, and if you don't want to talk, they've also trained the, the servers, etc. Don't talk to you. You know, some people don't want to be talked to, and they they they're trained not to. They 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 know they're pretty good. So at the good at the good restaurants, I always think sometimes that the like the secret theme of all of our podcasts together is the rich experience of solo travel. And those two stories were right in there. That's really just it's all about the experience. Speaking of experience, I wanted to go back again to the food trucks. I love food trucks. They've come so far, like you mentioned. But there's so many other unique food options that people have. It's not just food trucks. What are some of your thoughts about solo travel and some of these special food options? Food is becoming more and more something that is focused on. You know, with the whole foodie movement and a lot of young people, they're experimenting with all different kinds of cuisines and fusions of cuisines. And I mean, food now all over the world is uh, uh, getting on a a much more interesting and a higher level. Well, uh, a couple of the different places you can kind of get uh, some interesting food experiences 
or uh, some of the different ways. First and foremost, uh, in what I've been doing here for about the last three years, is taking food tours. And food tours are really starting to um, grow in number and grow in uh, what I consider uh, a great food experience. But typically, when you go on a food tour, you'll get uh, information about the history of the place, the culture, and how the food uh, interfaces with that. You'll get a lot of information on food preparation. Uh, You'll typically be taken to uh, restaurants that you probably wouldn't know to, to go to. And you just really get a good feel for a place when you when you experience their food with somebody who is teaching you or showing you uh, a lot of the nuances that you would know besides the flavor. These food tours are really great fun, and and they they are a food adventure. So I have been doing them where when I travel. Uh, I want to share one example, which was just probably one of the best ones I've ever taken, was when I was in Marrakesh on my Around the World solo trip last year. I had Googled before the different food tours, or if they had any, and there were two companies that did it, but I keyed in on one because there were more reviews about it, and they'd been written up by, I think, Travel and Leisure, or one of the bigger travel resources. So I booked the tour, and it was just fantastic. We met at the Medina uh, at around 6, 6.30 at night. We went through the, the big square where all of the music is playing, the snake charmers, the food stalls are being set up. I mean, the, you know, dusk is coming down. You'll hear the call to prayer. I mean, it is just full of life and color. Well, the the guide started us uh, on the tour. We went through there. Then we went to all the different markets, the olive market, uh, spice market, just di- all the di- meat market, all the different markets. So he, he took us into the markets first and told us different, you know, unique things about this, that, and other. We got to taste all kinds of different olives and and the smell the spices and oh i mean to smell freshly ground spices oh my gosh i mean you don't even need to eat you just s- smell <laughs> 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 so then he took us to the best local tangine restaurants and we got to meet the uh, owners and and they they went into how the tangine, uh, the lamb tangine was done, and we saw the the hand thrown pots that they use and the spices that they put in, and and just just how it was very simply uh, put together in these pots. Then we were taken down and shown the ovens where they were cooked, and it, they cook for like six to eight hours, and all the juices are in there. Then we got to eat tangine, and I mean, you know, it was wonderful. We we were on the second floor. He had like an open air outdoor kind of area to the restaurant, and the eight people on the tour we were eating tangine, and it it was just wonderful. And you know, we went to um, some other places where they did like specialty kind of rolls in uh, Moroccan types of hors d'oeuvres, a sweet shop. We went also deep into or the underground, I'd say the bowels of the, <laughs> of the Medina, where there's a communal oven. And this is where all the bread was made. And what it, they shared is that they have all of these ladies that every day make the, the yeast in the, in the loaves of bread or the dough, the dough rolls, and they bring them to these communal ovens. So we got to see the ovens and we got to see the ladies making the bread. And, uh, you know, then, of course, we ate some bread, etc. But we ended on... We went to a very small couscous restaurant, and they probably only had seating for 
12 to 14 at the most. I mean, it, Small, it, yeah. I call this a mini restaurant, but it it's highly recommended on TripAdvisor. It's been written up. It's these uh, elder, it's this elderly lady and her two daughters that own it. And they make the best couscous, according to this gentleman who uh, does the food tours in Marrakesh. So it's a custom on Friday in Morocco to have couscous. That's what all the Moroccans do. And this is a time where they get together with family and friends. And couscous is served in like a big bowl, and it's, it's, a, it's kind of a wheat-like um, a food with lamb and vegetables. It's, it's kind of like a, a jambalaya with vegetables. <laughs> and uh, couscous instead of, or I forgot what you call what is in the couscous, but it is delicious. So we, they brought it on big round uh, silver trays like it is traditionally served. We had the little small hot mint tea with it. I mean, we had the best time ending our food tour that way. It was just great. We met the the chefs. We went back in the kitchen. They all, you know, hugging us and everything. But that that shows you, first of all, that, you know, a good restaurant has somebody who's cooking that cares and that it doesn't matter where it is. And, And any cuisine can be really good if it's prepared well with care. And uh, especially like, say, in a country that you might have had reservations in going to or you didn't think you'd like the food or maybe the culture was, you you had some issues with it. But to go into something like this and understand it more and then experience it through the food and meet the people who actually make their living this way, beautiful. And, you, and you know, you help make them happy, hopefully, by uh, dining with them and enjoying their food. That is one thing I like to share with everybody who's thinking about what I'm going to eat, how I'm going to solo dine, whatever. Take a food tour and take the food tour early in the trip. Because it, 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 you'll be amazed how much you learn about the place where you are. Oh, I bet. That's not even about the food. Then the other venue that's also really good are the markets. And especially in Europe. You, you know, the food markets are great. And like in Paris or in France, the food market is not just the buy fresh vegetables and meats and cheeses and whatever. They have cooks that are cooking they have takeout they have it's like little restaurants all over so the the markets in europe especially in france and i would say in spain and italy and more of the countries around the mediterranean germany not Mm. so much it's okay but not so much uh i haven't experienced the scandinavian uh, food markets but that's a good place to go now the asian food markets I've been to a few of those, and those are really about just the ingredients to food. I like mean, the commerce of food. It's not. Yes, you're, you're not dining I mean, there. Like I went to one. It. I was on a food tour in Hanoi, and the gentleman brought me to the food market in Hanoi. Oh my God! They had every part of every. Any animal that could be dismembered. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. (laughs) And they were selling it, and they eat it. So, but there were really no restaurants in there or anything you could buy there. It was strictly to get your fresh vegetables or, you know, your meats or whatever. So the food markets, I would say, in Europe, I can can attest to, they're they're really good. The pop-ups, they are becoming more and more... um, popular too i can't say that i've really done pop-ups yet but they are starting to to happen i mean especially with the apps they'll they'll decide well we're going to do a pop-up restaurant in on the left bank uh at eight o'clock make the reservation and they'll you know they'll set up a tent and the table the whole thing i haven't done that yet but that is an option now if you i know there are apps that have it etc but one, one other uh, option that I want to talk about that I think is really 
shows you or hammers in this point that solo dining is becoming more and more enjoyable, accepted, and uh, here to stay is when I was doing research here again for this podcast, I came across this restaurant called Ean Mall, E-E-N-M-A-A-L. This restaurant concept was started by a woman. She uh, is from Amsterdam. The first one was, uh, her first restaurant was in Amsterdam. But this restaurant is totally only for solos. All tables for one. It's fine dining. It The decor is beautiful. Her, I guess you say her philosophy is, this is an attractive place for contemporary disconnection. And let me tell you, it is really popular. The menus are structured to where the proportions are good for a solo diner. Uh, you have Champagne bottles, little small bottles, everything is geared for the solo diner. And uh, when I was doing the research and I stumbled upon this, I clicked on the video to see what the restaurants really look like. And they're, they're really nice. I mean, it is it just blew my mind, this concept. But it's grown. She has restaurants now in Antwerp, Berlin, London, and New York. And she does pop-ups. She does, uh, she's had a couple of them in the Victorian Albert Museum. Uh, I think it's on Thursday nights. They do usually something that it, at the Victorian Albert Museum that is social, a lot of times with food. And also uh, in the Hotel Hungarian uh, in London. So now we actually have a restaurant that is strictly for tables for one. Now, that's really cool. And I foresee her concept growing all over the world because this is this is fine dining. I mean, it's not super fine, but this is very good food. This is not like quick in and out or whatever. I, th- I, th- I even learned something. I was just completely shocked. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, I think that in this, in our time together, you've done a really great job of showing that the food part of your trip can really be an experience. And we already know, everybody knows that food is a really important part of different cultures, right? What do you say to the solo traveler to make sure that they are getting the most out of their, the culinary part of their solo travels? Well, I'm going to kind of summarize a lot of what we've talked to to answer this question because you know the culinary experience it's got all these different parts you know it's not just the food so you got to select the right restaurant don't don't just eat anywhere and expect that um, you're going to be totally satisfied with it especially as a uh, solo diner but then don't be afraid just to kind of stumble upon something because I'm going to tell another little story. I was in Lisbon and the last night I wanted to go to the main restaurant that I had put on my list to go to, the the most highly rated Michelin restaurant in Lisbon. So I saved it for the last meal. Well, I go there and it is closed. Again, another one, yeah. Again, so I was so upset, but I was in a very nice area of Lisbon, and if you know Lisbon, it has a lot of hills. Well, I started going up this hill, and I was starving to death. But I thought, well, I'm going to go in the direction of my hotel. This is a good area. I know I'll find something good there. Well, I kept walking. I looked in one restaurant. It looked really nice. They said, oh, we don't open until eight. And I thought to myself, I've got to eat. You know, it was like 5.30 or 6, and I was really, really hungry. So I kept on, and I mean, I was almost famished. And I finally got to the top of the hill, and I saw this little sign. It was a taverna. And tavernas are are like uh, taverns, uh, but they usually have really good ethnic food. So I went down the steps and looked in, and oh my God, I love the way this place was decorated. It had beautiful tiles, and they had communal tables and little tables for two, all these pictures of 
soccer and movie stores and, and everything. I mean, it just looked like a neighborhood place where everybody went in and just celebrated life and food. So I decided I've got to eat here because I'm so hungry. And there really wasn't too many people in there because I was early. And they eat late in Lisbon, okay? So I sit down. And one of the other things that I hadn't gotten to eat in, in uh, Lisbon that I really wanted to was grilled sardines. That is one of their specialties. But for somewhere, wherever I went, I never found grilled sardines. So I sit down and they give me the water and the bread, which the bread was great, though, that it was already a good side. And I looked at the menu, ha, oh, grilled sardines. <laughs> so I knew that this is where I was supposed to eat. So I was so excited when I saw the sardines. I said, this is it. I, you know, I, I'm going to just get my sardines. So I got the sardines, a little half bottle of wine. Uh, I sat there and started watching the people come in. They had a big, beautiful tank with the fresh lobsters rolling around. And, oh, they had a, what, a ham hock or whatever it was where they cut the prosciutto. I mean, this place just had so much authenticity and layers. It was just great. So that, and that just happened by luck. Okay. So, and that will happen to you. All right. But that, you know, I knew by when I first went in there, it looked right. It was clean. It had a vibe. You could tell that there was layers of life that had been in there. Good sign. Go ahead and, and eat, you know, and, and, and take this chance. So that's one of the things. Pick your restaurant carefully. If you don't run into one, get the recommendations from the concierge. Do your research. Rip, read the trip advisor, et cetera, and make your list, okay? Then... Just relax about it. If you know you're going to have to eat by yourself, whether it's on one night, one day, or I went 50 days around the world solo, just just relax about eating. Whenever you go to eat, be in the frame of mind. You're going to enrich your body. You're going to enjoy the food. If it doesn't taste good, I mean, every now and then you're going to order something that just does not taste good to you. Well, if it doesn't taste good, it's just part of the thing. Order something else. And usually, if if I order something that I don't like or didn't, I always go for the dessert. And it's hard for desserts to be bad. <laughs> dessert and most wine will solve a lot (laughs) that's just a life tip that's just a that's not a solo trout that's just for plain old life so you have your list of where you want to eat and what you want to eat because you know here you go to different areas of the country of the united states or in the world they eat differently then if you're staying at a good hotel that's always a good bet because a good hotel will have good restaurants in it and, you know, if that's what the only thing you're comfortable with, you'll, you'll have a pretty good experience there in most of them. I just recently uh, spent between Christmas and New Year at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach. Oh, now, that is a hotel. I mean, it's very historic. It's beautiful. They've just renovated to the tune of a billion dollars. They have 12 restaurants in there, and every one of them, and I think I ate in every one of them at one meal, it's unbelievable. I mean, they have two Michael Mina restaurants. They have a Hakkasan. They have the best sweet shop, pastry shop I have ever eaten, I think anywhere in the world. I mean, it was so over-the-top great fabulous Mediterranean grill overlooking the Atlantic poolside service with whatever you want. I mean, this place was something. So if you stay at a good hotel, typically they'll have at least one real good restaurant and they know there are uh, their solo guests there and they'll, they'll take good care of you. So that's another way to ensure that. Then where are you going to sit? When you go into the restaurant and they start to seat you if they don't ask you where you would like to sit look for those places that i shared with you are you in the mood for the bar are you in the mood for a communal table are you in the mood for sitting at a table for two 
Do you want to be on a banquette? Do you want to be in the corner? You know, you kind of decide where you feel like it because you either want to be looking at the people who are dining or you don't want to look at them. Or you want to talk to somebody or have that opportunity or you do not want that opportunity. So that that will ensure that the solo dining uh, experience at that meal will be good. Okay? It, it, and I, here again, I haven't said this yet, but I love to sit outside. So when there are restaurants that I'm going to, and if I have to sit, if I have the option to sit outside, especially if the weather's nice, that's great for solos. Sitting outside is great because they typically put you in a table where, you know, you, you're real comfortable. Just learn and teach yourself to focus more on the food. When you're with somebody, you're going to be tasting the food, talking, thinking about other things. But if you're by yourself, you're more, your senses are always heightened to everything. Try to develop more of being in tune of what you're tasting, smelling, seeing. It makes you more enriched, and you do enjoy it more once you get used to that and you think about it. You know, I think as Americans, a lot of times we just eat and run, or we just eat fast, and, you know, if the food's okay, then that's good enough, you know, but when you're on your vacation, you should uh, try to have everything good. (laughs) I love to people watch, so this is a great time to people watch, so if that's, if, if you like to do that here again, sit on the tables where you can look out. Dress nicely. I mean, I know that sounds maybe a little corny, but the nicer that you dress, and you don't have to dress up fancy unless it's or something really that you're supposed to. But you, you, the, the, everybody gives you more respect from the waiters to the maitre d to to the people around you. That's just a little small tip that is not totally necessary, but I think it's it's smart to do. Lunch is always most of the time my big meal because. I could eat really ex- at really expensive places, and it, it's a lot cheaper, and the crowd is different. It, at nighttime, it's really a lot of times about couples or, or, or groups that are, you know, they have their mind on other things. You know, lunch is more, or they're, they're into their day. I try to eat the big meal at lunch, and really just be confident. You know, even if you feel a little kind of shaky, you have to play like somebody else is with you. Just be confident and and relax and and talk to the waiter if you feel like talking or the person next to you if you're comfortable and saying something. Just just be like you would be at at your uh in your hometown. And you'll be surprised just being relaxed and confident does help you uh, really enjoy the moment in, in, in the experience. Channel that Parisian lady that you described at the beginning of the show. Oh, yes. She was, I mean... Confidence personified. Oh, yes. She was so together and serene. It was really, it was, it was, I'll never forget her. In the end, if you... Uh, feeling anxious or you don't you know you can't really enjoy yourself pull out your phone (laughs) journal bring a magazine I mean now let me tell you something when you go anywhere most people are on their phone every now and then and so you know whether you're in a group or solo you've got the social the phone so (laughs) a lot of people I'll see They'll just start taking pictures of the food that they're <laughs> eating. They're posting on social media. <laughs> so, so the solo dining is, you're not really solo anymore if you have an iPhone. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I hate to, I hate to end it this way, but that is the real truth. And so, you, do, you, you know, just don't even worry anymore about feeling alone. <laughs> I'm surprised that you would say that. I'm really shocked that you would suggest the phone. Well, I left it for last. I didn't didn't really talk about it because, 
you know, you don't want to have to resort to that. But let me tell you, it is all part of our family. I mean, family, a part of our life now. It's like our new relative. <laughs> let's, okay, but let's let's encourage our listeners. Let's use that as the emergency backup. You've yes. done all these other things. What... This is the only, in a case of uh, you just can't get it together otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, 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 uh, and that's, what I, that's, that's why I saved it for last. Okay. But I'll kind of sum it up. You just have to have really the 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 right mindset and and kind of think of it is like you're going to take time to do something that's really special or nice for yourself you're taking yourself out to dinner well there probably couldn't be a better ending than that you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and really find it any of the finer places that podcasts can be found. We invite you to rate us, review us, and if you like what you're hearing, please share us with a friend. Be sure to go to Astrid's website, astridtravel.com, and avail yourself of all the resources she has there, including her amazing packing list. If you dread packing, this packing list is going to save you. Just go to her homepage, astridtravel.com, and there's a place that you can download and get that packing list right away. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to seeing you next week on Solo Travel Talk. Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. Follow Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To learn more about Astrid or solo travel advisors, visit our website, astridtravel.com.